We already had some great talks about international markets, the importance of them, but wanted to give a little details about once you've decided to enter these markets, what do you really need to do? And as were the strategies of going to US and Europe first are, are, is kind of going to the wayside, you now have to present a global strategy. How can you start smart from the beginning during medical device product development to get into these global markets? You know, we've seen different forms of this before, you know, your medical device product development pathway, talk, talking about, um, you know, finding your unmet need, doing concept, feasibility, regulatory strategy. But of course, you know, what it looks like in reality is something like this, right? You have all these iterations of going back and forth, goes to the clinic, goes to a physician, they give you feedback, you go back to design, you know, Worst case, you know, we actually fail an endpoint on a clinical trial and go back to the, to the drawing board. So the process to bring a medical device to market isn't straightforward. And then as soon as you begin incorporating US, Europe, China, Brazil into this matrix, it becomes very complicated very quickly. Yet there are strategies to begin your medical device development early on while thinking about these other products and these other, uh, th having these other countries in mind. Looking at the medical device product development you know, pathway, uh, thinking early on the global regulatory strategy is key. And as I mentioned you know, before, and we've talked before, when you, if you're an R&D group and a large company and you're gonna go and try to convince a product manager who has P&L responsibility to pick up your product, or you're an investor, who, or excuse me, or you're a startup looking to an investor, both of those decision makers want a global strategy. They want to know what have you done to prepare to go into China, to go into Brazil. It might not be that you're there today, it might not, you know, because you didn't have the resources before an acquisition, but to show that you're prepared to get into that market can be a real significant impact on that decision maker's uh, process. And why? Because all the, and why do we want to worry about global markets? Because those are the ones that are growing. You know, we looked at a lot of this data um, at the previous speaker. And to kind of look at the China numbers just a little bit differently, you can see China's GDP growth has been growing very significantly. But if you look at the bottom line, which shows healthcare expenditures, it's relatively low. So again, looking at your target markets, how is your product going to be used? Similar story to Brazil. Again, we saw a lot of that data in the last talk. But similar case, right? GDP is rising faster than healthcare expenditures in most of these emerging markets, right? They want to get rich, they want to you know, get more stable first, and then bring up um, the standard of other standards of living and healthcare does have a tendency to lag behind. You know, the, a, a case study that uh, TUV pr uh, presented, um, and I'll just talk about um, here, is you know, the company that wants to get into Europe first, right? That's been the traditional model. Go to Europe first, it's faster, it's easier pathway, get in a couple months. But as soon as you get European approval, or any kind of approval, you're gonna start getting emails from distributors all over the world. I wanna get into your, I wanna, you know, I wanna sell your product, I wanna sell your product. And unless you have that home country approval requirement, and meet that, you can't do anything, right? So historically, uh, for China, for example, some people have had to go back to their notified bodies, changed their, their origins, you know, where their, their country of origin is. China is literally changing the rules June 1st. That's going to make it much harder to do that. Their definition of legal manufacturer is actually changing. So some of those old workarounds are not going to work. And um, I was on a call with a rather large company earlier this week talking, OK, for our you know, thousand products we have in China, what does that mean? Right? And how because they've used this pathway historically. Now, what does this mean for our products going forward? How do we address these concerns? And then, once you get into the market, right, you also have to look at revenue strategy, right? In the US, you might be on a reimbursement path, but in other markets, it might be more of a cost of goods prop proposition or a market share proposition. And understanding where you fit is clearly, you know, is, a, is very significant. So getting into the regulatory strategy, Part, there's several ways to bring products into the marketplace, right? You, have a, you might have the best idea in the world, right? And that might be to bring that into the market directly, it could be disruptive. And no matter where, what regulatory agency you're talking to, whether it's the FDA, EU, CFDA in China, 
disruptive products, few predicates, it's gonna take a while. You could also think creatively or, you know, could I do a series of three or four or five 10Ks to get there? Could I develop some precedents, get some revenue going along the way, ease my path to market? And that's actually a fine tr strategy. If you look at a company like Bard, you know, every six months they're coming out with a new thing, right? So if you're trying to keep up with them and, you know, you have a two-year development cycle and you're betting on, okay, this, they just released this product, now we're going to try to catch up, you're constantly going to be behind. So doing this incremental product development can ease regulatory pathways and still be fine strategy from a business perspective. Now your regulatory strategy very early on can have significant impacts globally. So indications for use in the US, which you then translate directly into China or Brazil, might be a different classification. You know, so looking at what are the gaps in my regulatory strategy, what are the testing requirements that I'm gonna have to do to meet these, to meet these goals very early on is important. We have a lot of cases where just because on their indication for use in the US is fine or Europe is fine becomes an issue in China and it has to relate directly, right? They don't, they need differences in paperwork. I'm going to talk about China a lot just because the new regulations just came out. Um, but it can really slow down your registration. So doing that kind of regulatory gap analysis at the beginning, what are my classification requirements, things of that nature are significant. Um, you know, and also, you know, it impacts testing, labeling, IFUs, as well as clinical trials, right? Again, going back to China, clinical trial requirements in China are going to become much more stringent, so you're going to have to probably have some Chinese clinical trial data. So if you're setting up a global trial, even if you're going to U.S. or Europe, you might want to include a site in China. It might be a bit of a pain to do that, but it could save you two years of market entry once you decide to go there. Right? And that's two years of revenue that you would be missing out on otherwise. Um, testing. So China, Korea, they don't like, and a lot of the Asian countries don't really like risk assessments. Right? So something that you might do here, the material has a really strong history in the marketplace. You're just going to do a risk assessment, you know, have a board certified toxicologist. Um, you know, I'm from the consulting group at, at NAMSA. We're 300 strong on that side, and we do a lot of risk assessments. We have several board-certified toxicologists that do that 40 hours a week, if not more. Um, but that really doesn't fly in a lot of countries, so you have to consider testing. Uh, implants, right? If you have an implant, the Korea and China, they interpret ISO standards a little bit differently, and they actually want more endpoints. So when you're doing your six-month 10993 implant study, if you don't include a one-week and a four-week endpoint, which no one really does for the U.S. or Europe, you're, that's not going to be accepted in China. You know, NAMSA test reports are accepted pretty well in China. Um, you don't have to repeat a lot of your testing, fortunately, but only if you're meeting those requirements. And that could be, you know, an extra $10,000 on a $150,000 test isn't a big deal. Repeating that $150,000 test and losing that six months to market could be significant. So these are just some of the considerations that are important. Also, you know, Understanding where your testing is going to be done, right? While the labs might be nice, the, you might have to do, go in, educate them on how to actually do your tests, educate them and, in a nice way about what the products are going to look like. Um, I, was, I actually gave a talk um, in Korea to the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety uh, three weeks ago, uh, if my calendar in my head is right, um, about you know testing and requirements and things of that nature so they want to learn and they want to be educated same thing in china in uh, china you know we're in china all the time there there's me and our general manager with uh, the head of the tianjin test lab who we work with quite a bit but again think about how your product's going to be tested what are the regulatory requirements um, all that downstream of course reimbursement last talk did a great job on that talking about how's my product going to be used. You know, in this picture, I mean, they even ran out of a bed for this poor guy. So what you might consider a, even a common product here in the U.S. might be something high-end there. You know, incorporate how much physician training am I really going to have to do to get adoption. So all of those go into consideration. Moving quickly along, my last slide is post-market, right? Health economics and post-market Requirements is kind of what you have to do now to get reimbursement to show and differentiate from competitors and that's true around the world, US, Europe, Asia, wherever you want. Health economics is the way to go. Um, we're doing a lot of clinical trials in, um, throughout Asia right now 
and uh, post-market studies around the world to meet this demand. Uh, lastly, you know, or in addition to that, you know, what do you need to do to train the sales force of your distributor, to train the physician, and the whole time make sure you're compliant, right? Make sure your distributor can meet the local regulations. You know what, you might just assume that your Chinese distributor is gonna meet all the requirements. They may not be, and there's new, as of June 1st, if you have a class three product in China, or even a class two, they have to have a quality system to track all of their products until it gets to the end user, what, the hospital or physician. And if it might not, in your might be a class one, right, okay, great, but if they sell class threes and come in, get a CFD audit and get shut down, your product's not gonna get distributed either. So taking a look at your complete distribution pathway to ensure compliance, throughout the life cycle is important. So you can email me here, if you can read it up there, sgoldenberg at namsa.com. 